So um, hopefully you already have the slides as well. But uh, how this talk is going to be structured is something like I talk 10, 15 minutes, then you work 15 minutes, half an hour, we'll see. Then I talk again, then you work. And during the phases when I'm not talking, if, if you are lucky and I'm not talking, then you can come with all kinds of questions, right? So I, can, I will then have time to go around and help you with problems. Um, what you can expect out of this talk, well, at the very beginning, I will introduce this virtual human idea, which is uh, it's a result of a large European collaboration. Um, I think it really well fits this biomedicine topic because the major aim of this virtual human is to be able to create simulated models on which they can test drugs, for example, or new therapies. Then uh, every now and then I will touch on different uh, HPC ideal ideologies, but uh, this talk is not really a theoretical one, so it's meant to be a really applied talk. You are going to have to write a little bit of a code, modify files, compile stuff, run simulations. Um, I uh, planned three or four different applications. We'll see how far we get. During the first one, we are going to go really slow. Uh, I will help with every step. After that one, for the second one, I will assume that you already know steps, and if you have the PDF, you can always just scroll back and see how it was done in the, free, in the first application. At the third one, I will give less directions and so on and so on. So it will become a bit more difficult with every, every application, but we will go faster with every, every application as well. Um, and in the end, because of the context, you will hear a lot probably about blood flows and biology related to blood flows, diseases related to blood flows. So let's start with this virtual human. And if I'm lucky, I can start all of these at once. Yeah. So um, these videos, by the way, were rendered here in Barcelona about a year ago. And you can find the whole uncut video up on YouTube if you follow that link. But I just uh, cherry-picked a few examples out of the virtual human model. So um, we have very good skeletal models. And when I say we, that basically means the guy is here in Barcelona, because that part is being developed here. Um, all kinds of simulations about how drug delivery could work in a respiratory system of a human. Obviously, blood flow related things. Uh, I will come back to that one. The most mature model probably is the human heart model. Here you can see some drug binding uh, in a cancer research. And the last one, which is basically the highlight of this talk, is the cellular level simulation of blood flows. Now, the major difference between these two is uh, the length scale. So here you see a larger artery, which is about a couple millimeter. Typically, that one specifically is in your brain. And uh, it's treated with this metallic coil like thing, this metallic mesh. It's called the flow diverter. And the idea behind that is that if you see this uh, bulgeoning, which is now on the top, it's not really healthy. It can rupture, uh, which would lead to stroke. And to avoid that, what they typically do, medicals, insert medical devices such as this one to divert the flow. Now, uh, where cellular stuff comes into play is that if you look at the bottom, then this metallic structure here is actually a part of this stent. So you can imagine it as zooming in on this mesh, one part of it. And since the diameter of the mesh is something like 50 micron, it's already in the same regime as cells. So cellular effects will start to play a role. Uh, on a larger scale, what researchers do when we are talking about blood flow simulations, it's something like this on the whole body level that would be this guy there. We have a very simplified description, typically a one-dimensional network with connections, with uh, edges. We can make it one and a half dimensional, meaning that we can assign different properties to the edges, like um, vessel radius and so on. But uh, that is a fast computation, usually meaning that several heartbeat cycles can be computed even on a notebook in a couple of minutes. Then. Usually we have a region of interest. For example, here we have a very similar problem that you saw previously uh, with this bulgeoning, an aneurysm. Uh, we are interested in the flow in, in much more detail there. So what we do, 
is we model the 3D geometry of this part of the vessel really accurately, and on the boundaries, we get information from the 1D model. So the 1D model informs us, for example, how fast blood flows in here. But it will not inform us, of course, about the detailed flow structure. For that, we need the 3D model. And then as soon as we introduce micromedical devices, like uh, the metallic mesh was in the previous slide, we need the cellular level where, again, we can open up like a small box, zoom in, and model it in a cellular level description. And then, of course, we can continue this. Um, we can go down to protein level with uh, protein chain unfoldings. And then we get to the domain of molecular dynamics. So the biology part, I'll be quick. <coughs> Our blood is, for this talk at least, is constituted from blood plasma, which is more or less, you can think of it like water, with a couple of proteins flowing in it. So it's a bit more dense than water, but basically, let's say water. And then quite a few cells are flowing in this water. First and foremost, red blood cells and platelets. Sometimes uh, we also model white blood cells and, uh, and other stuff I will talk about it later. But the point is that we have a really dense suspension where the basis is um, blood plasma, which is sort of like water. And then we put a lot of deformable cells. Almost half the volume is made up from red blood cells, 40%, typically 40, 40 something. So we have a dense suspension with deformable objects in it. That is really not easy to handle. If, uh, if you did CFD simulations, which, which uh, only deal with the fluid part, um, in COMSOL, in ANSYS, in whatever program, then you already know that doing those simulations are difficult or can be really difficult. And uh, of course, it adds to the complexity when you introduce immersed bodies inside that flow that can deform, that can collide, and so on. And um, in our vessels, due to these deformable objects, there are a lot of phenomena that uh, makes it um, really unique and difficult to handle. One thing is, for example, that these deformable cells migrate away from the wall. So there is a layer next to your vessel wall, which is only constituted of plasma. That is sort of a lubrication layer. Um, and the side effect of that is then when you have a branching, you have quite a lot of branchings, then the amount of hematocrite in the side branch is going to be less than in the main branch because there is a lot of plasma close to the wall and of course the side branch is on the side of the vessel close to the wall. So a larger volume of plasma will go into that. Um, I will link this up with computational stuff, so don't worry, this is not just out of the air. So what we are going to do today, we will use this uh, so-called HemoCell framework and um, we will simulate flows something like on the right side. Uh, probably the visualization will not be this good because uh, that rendering used a couple thousand cores and it was running for a few days, so it will be a bit less fancy. But uh, the scientific value is basically the same, the same HemoCell computation run there as well. Um, what you will need at some point is to go to this HemoCell website because that's where we will download the source code from. If uh, you cannot access it for some reason, then um, at the same place where you had the PDF file, I also uploaded the files uh, we will need from HemoCell and Palabos. But, uh, and I will tell in detail what to download and from where exactly. But before we dive in, so that you know what you will compile and what you will work with. HemoCell is practically a layer on top of a CFD solver. Uh, for CFD, we use Pelabos, which is a Lattice Boltzmann-based open source package. You can download it, and for fluid dynamical problems, it's a pretty good package. We build on top of that, introduce the cells. So basically, Pelabos handles the blood plasma, and uh, on top of Pelabos, this HemoCell extension handles all the cells, deformable stuffs, whatnot. And uh, this is the API level, of course, and on top of that, there are lots of extensions. A few I will show, but we will not really work with those today. Those are a bit more complicated. So <clears throat> this is part of why I will organize the talk as it is that I'm talking, you're working, I'm talking. This is the first step where you will see why it makes sense. HemoCell is practically a large library. To compile it, it will take at least 10 minutes. And uh, since you will compile it on the login nodes, and there are like, what, three login nodes, and uh, 20 something of you in the room, it's going to take some time. So 
before continuing with the context, I would like everybody to get up to the point of compiling the Hemosa. Then we will conti I will continue the talk a little bit. And um, hopefully I will finish by the time compilation finishes. So first step, um, I asked the organizers to disseminate that you will need one of these pro programs installed. I hope you got the message, but if not, it's a pretty quick job. So first off, you will need a terminal that you have for sure, because how else could you work in the previous two um, lectures? You will need some program to move files between your computer and the server. That can be um, HCP if you have that already installed and you're familiar with that. If you are more like a clicking person and uh, you don't want to go to the manual right now, for Windows, I advise this WinHCP, for Mac CyberDuck, for Linux FileZilla. These are all free softwares, a couple of megabytes, and can save you some time and can save me some time as well if I don't have to yeah, run everywhere to copy files. So one terminal for everybody, one program with which you can copy files between your local notebook and between the server, the login nodes of, uh, of Mare Nostrum, right? You will need an editor on your local notebook. Well, if you are li really um, living deep in the matrix, I don't mind if you edit everything uh, on the login node, up to you. Um, these user interface stuffs typically allow you to set some editor on your notebook. So when you open a file for editing in uh, one of these editors, it will create a local copy on your notebook, open up in your local editor, and whenever you save, then it will copy that back to the server. It's just convenient. But if you're used to another workflow, fine. Whatever works for you. Um, and everybody will need the latest version of Pereview. Also free, also you can download it, 50 something megabytes. But uh, that's how you can visualize the simulation results, right? So otherwise, it's just big binary files, which is fun, but you know. All right, uh, just quickly so that I can have an idea who has at least one of these currently installed? That's not a lot. Then uh, please do install. But first, uh, this is the idea that I hope that most of you now have that two archive file in the home directory or somewhere underneath that. The first step would be to unzip the Hemo cell uh, file. This is basically the source code then that's also on GitHub. And then the second step is to copy the Pelabos archive file inside the directory that you just uncompressed. <coughs> right? And I will do it in a terminal in a moment as well. Then you can just go into this Himocell folder and execute a setup script. Usually you shouldn't execute foreign scripts, I'm just saying, but this time I set it up so <coughs> that uh, it uncompresses all the stuff you need. It runs a few patching commands um, the point is that it sets up for the source, co the source code for uh, compilation on Mara Nostrum, right? Um, these commands should be familiar, hopefully. At least you heard them a few times, right? Um, okay, so I will wait till this point, and then we will discuss these three steps. I can also switch to a terminal in the meantime and show how it should look for you. It does. So the point of yeah. So the point of this step is that if you already have it there, it will not download it. I show it right on the terminal. It should work. So in practice, this is the same situation you start from. I have a folder and. Uh, and I will put it to full screen. 
if I can grab it. I have a folder with the two zip files in there. So as a first step, I can just unzip the HemoCell archive, which is the source code that you saw on GitHub as well. And then, of course, the only thing is that that blue directory appeared. So now we can copy. Yeah, that helps. And then for the recording, I will. No. Doesn't help. Theory, now I just, as much as you can see, I just copied that file to the HemoCell folder. We can go into the HemoCell folder and uh, execute the setup script, which will then find the uh, compressed Pelabos sources, uncompress them, and this last batch of uh, files um, or lines show you that uh, there was some patching in the background meaning that we modified some of the underlying Pelabos files to be able to run it on Mare Nostrum. So this, this is what you need. I, this is what I typed exactly, character by character. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the first step that you have to upload it with FileZilla. With? With FileZilla, for example. FileZilla, it's an application. Or, or CyberDuck, if you yeah, have Mac. Cyber with CyberDuck, you can upload these files, this Pelabos and that HemoCell master to the server, for example, to the work folder, or wherever you want to. Also useful if you have the PDF that you can practically copy paste these comments. Okay, so uh, I'm curious how many people got to the part that you have uh, a patched source code of HemoCell? A few, good. And the rest of you? How many people have these two archives on the login node already, somewhere? Okay. Uh, let's move on a little bit. Um, and let's discuss what you are currently compiling. And then hopefully you'll be able to run it as well. We will even break it. But uh, for a start, we will use at the first simulation red blood cells, a single red blood cells to be more precise. In this model, a red blood cell looks like somewhat this. Probably you do not see the mesh here, but this is, it's a triangulated mesh, which is uh, immersed into that plasma flow. And uh, along every edges and around every vertices, we prescribe a couple of uh, equations. These equations dictate for example, that the membrane should have area conservation, that this membrane should have some bending rigidity, that underneath this membrane, uh, in biology at least, uh, in the cells there are additional structures called cytoskeletal structures which provide the structure of the whole cell. Otherwise, if you, if you remove this part, then a red blood cell is like a plastic bag in fluid. It has no shape. Um, so the cytoskeleton stuff provides the structural stability. We also need equations to describe its behavior. And also inside the cell, it's filled with hemoglobin, in reality not with plasma. So um, we need additional equations to describe the increased viscosity of that hemoglobin. This whole stuff adds up to something like uh, 5,000 equations per red blood cell. Now, um, per red blood cell. Now I'm just saying this because this is the major reason why this is an HPC application. And um, usually 
uh, when I present it somewhere with computational people, the first question I get is that, do we really need this much because this is a huge number? And the thing is that this is the smallest number that is already adequate. So that's dictated by the number of points. If, if you can see the mesh, then you can see that it's not a really, really high resolution. It's not really low resolution either, but it's not a crazy high resolution to describe this biconcave shape. And if you look at these numbers that we have 2,000 edges, so if I write up one equation per edge, that's already 2,000 equation for just this cell. And uh, as I've said, we need a couple. So yeah, it's 5,000 equations. It's a lot, but this is the smallest amount that already works and gives back the normal properties of red blood cells. And um, I will a bit later show what normal properties mean. And if you are successful at compiling this stuff, then we will run one of the validation tests how uh, in a lab they check the mechanical properties of a red blood cell. Um, and in humo cells, there are additional things. For example, there are cells with a rigid cell core that also adds to the model. There are cell types where we want to model a parasite inside the cell. I will show that later. That also adds. And then, of course, um, this is just the mechanics. We might want to couple it with uh, additional biology. For example, plate ca platelets can stick to the wall that has all kinds of biological equations. For example, they can interact with proteins and so on. So this is the simplest case. That's, uh, that's the point. It's 3D. 3D, of course, strictly 3D. Um, how it works, you will not see this part when running the code, but uh, I really want to, you to know it, that this is what's happening in the background. We have the plasma flow in Pelabos. That's why you needed the Pelabos source code. That's the red grid. The fluid is solved with Lattice-Boltzmann method that um, if you are a bit familiar with CFDs, then you probably heard about finite volume, finite element, finite different, finite something. Those discretizations, well, at least element and, and volume, they use body fitted shapes. You can see tetrahedras, hexagons, and so on. The, one of the advantage and also probably a bit of a drawback, so one of the peculiarities of Lattice-Boltzmann is that we are using a regular grid. That means that every single node looks the same. Why this is really good for HPC is I think it lends itself that it's really easy to parallelize because if you have two processors, then you can just cut here. Half of it is solved on one processor, half of it on the other one, and then we need some uh, communication on the interface. But if you have body fitted cells like with finite volume, all kinds of different shapes, it's much more difficult to partition up the domain, for example. It's much more difficult to define communication interface and so on. So this is really well suited for HPC applications, also for GPU, for example. And the cells on top of it are represented as immersed boundary meshes. That means that we have a couple of points, Lagrangian points, that can just flow with or follow the flow. So they are not fixed in space. They do not have a structure. And these two different grid types are coupled through forces. An iteration looks something like you put down this ellipsoid, let's say. This is now our two-dimensional cell. We'll work in three dimension, but for now. The flow starts, let's say, towards the door. So all these points will move a little bit to the right. But let's say the flow here is a bit faster than on the side. So these points will move a little bit further inside. If we have a mechanical model, like we have those 5,000 equations for the red blood cell, then we can compute that how our cell will react to this deformation. It will want to push back towards the fluid. And that pushback is communicated towards the fluid as an external force. Then the fluid will feel that force and will behave accordingly and a new iteration starts. The flow moves a little bit, then we move these points according to the flow and compute the forces uh, arising our cell and then we exert that back on the fluid. And then we start again. So this is the basic iteration loop. And uh, to do this, around every single point on the surface, this is practically the triangulated mesh that you saw previously. We have small kernels that are uh, like interpolation stencils. So this point will communicate with those fluid nodes that are underneath this blue square. It will exert force on these and we'll gather velocity from those as well during this iterative loop. This is the fluid structure coupling. There are lots of fluid, cup, uh, fluid structure coupling methods uh, that you might be aware of you. 
or you will meet a few at some point. This is one of the simplest one, uh, really fast to compute and it has relatively good stability as well. So what can we do with this model? Hopefully in the meantime you are compiling, <clears throat> but at some point when you are done and we'll be able to run it. Um, one current research, for example, which constitutes a single cell is about white blood cells. Those are part of your immune system. And uh, for mechanical point of view, it's interesting that they have a cell core. So while uh, red blood cells have uh, hemoglobin and cytoplasm inside, which is like a gale, they are fluid in the, on the inside as well. These have, you can imagine as a smaller sphere inside, which is rigid or much less deformable. Now we do not know the mechanical properties of the core. What we can do is uh, we can take one white blood cell and for example, suck it up a little bit with a micro pipette. And from the suction pressure and the deformation, we can uh, reverse engineer sort of the properties of the membrane, but we cannot reverse engineer the properties of the core. So instead, <coughs> we simulate these uh, small narrow gaps, like those that are in your spleen, for example, and how this passes through these narrow gaps. And we can record the time it takes for it to pass through. And if you make the inner core more rigid, then it will take more time for the cell to squeeze through. If the inner core is really soft, that corresponds to the red version, then it just shoots through, basically, because it will deform a lot and uh, quickly slide through. But if you have a really rigid core, that's the blue one, it has to struggle a little bit to squeeze through. Uh, and of course, in experiments, we can measure what's the real transition time of a cell. And then we can just take a look at it. Yeah, it's, it's something like the green, for example. And then we know something about the mechanical properties of the core. So these simulations are often used in tandem with experimental measurements to supplement them, to infer values that are not possible to measure directly. Um, a similar, a bit more complicated example is malaria infection that's also implemented in HemoCell. That means that, uh, well, this is late stage malaria. Uh, malaria infection, you know, you get it from the mosquito. It has a really peculiar life cycle. Um, in many regions, it's still a huge problem. This is a late stage one, meaning that inside the red blood cell, the parasite is already matured practically ate up everything that's inside the red blood cell, so there is now just the red membrane around it and the parasite inside. The model, yeah, it's visible more or less. Um, we have an outer shell again, which is uh, depicted in blue, and uh, some mechanical structure for the parasite, which is depicted in red. And this whole shape comes from micro CT measurements. The idea again is that we do know the mechanical properties of the membrane, but we don't know anything about the parasite. For example, <clears throat> one idea, or that's the best idea really, how to uh, develop an effective vaccination or some countermeasure against the malaria is to disrupt its cycle. Um, when it's in your body already, there is little to do. What we can do is to somehow prevent, for example, the matured version to be get sucked up by the mosquito that can then transfer it to another people, uh, person. So we do know that the mosquito has a syringe that's in the range of, let's say, 20, 30 micron. So it's looking for small vessels in the range of 20, 30 micron. That's where it can penetrate and that's where it can suck blood from you. So if we can make, for example, this um, parasite softer, then what happens is it's the same effect that you saw at the very beginning that cells are migrating away from the wall. If they are soft, that they will go into the middle of the stream, in the middle of your vessel, and they will not go into side branches, meaning that all the malaria will stay in large arteries and it will not go to the level of small vessels. Um, and this is a point where simulations can help. It can help to decide what's the softness, for example, that we have to achieve. So that would mean that you take some chemical component that makes the inner structure softer, the inner malaria parasite a bit softer mechanically, which will make this whole cell softer and it will drive it into the bulk of flow instead of driving it to the walls. So it will not get down to the level of small vessels, so the mosquito cannot suck it up again. It's a bit more complicated, but uh, it's the same mechanical story as before, that we have some knowledge from experiments, 
and then we supplement them with simulations to get some new result. Um, another possibility that's also in the examples, we will not do this today, but you can using that source code. It's a red blood cell here cut in half. And what you see is uh, that these boxes, they represent the fluid nodes. It's a regular grid as we discussed before. Now, if we want to add inner viscosity to our cell for whatever reason, for example, because it's usually five times higher than uh, the outer plasma, then we need a fast algorithm that can track the fluid nodes inside. And this visualization shows uh, how it works in hemocell. Everything that's inside is now uh, green and what's outside is red. So for these green nodes, we just uh, add a much more viscosity. We make them five times more viscous than the red ones. And um, it has actually really interesting capabilities. On the right side, just briefly, uh, this is flow velocity. And this is the viscosity. So if you have a vessel, you flow blood through it, and you don't have this effect, plasma inside and outside, then you would get this red curve. Now you increase the inner viscosity five times, and what you can see is that the overall viscosity of the vessel increases a little bit, like up to 20% or so. This is a really interesting evolutionary effect, how our body solves that, yeah, our red blood cells, has to carry, they have to carry something that's really viscous, much more viscous than fluid. You can think honey, for example. But if, uh, if we mix it with blood plasma, then you will get a really viscous fluid in your vessels and your heart wouldn't be able to pump it. So the solution, it encapsulates this high viscous uh, fluid within these membranes. And what happens is that the overall viscosity then barely increases. Actually, there are um, research projects uh, on how to, uh, how to make trafficking of different material more efficient using similar ideas. But this is, again, one thing where uh, hemocell can be useful to look at, at differences. OK, and now we get to the point of uh, the simulation. Um, these are two typical validation tests that you can find uh, in the literature. These are golden standards in uh, defining mechanical properties of cells. The top one, <coughs> we just put a single cell in shear flow, meaning that the flow in the bottom points this way, on the top that way, we shear it, and we look at the deformation. And depending on material properties, the deformation can be larger or smaller. This is one, this is not what we are going to do. We will do this one at the bottom because I think it's a bit better. We take a cell and stick two silica beads to the two opposing sides. Now this right seed, maybe I have a better video, is uh, fixed. Yeah, I have. This bead is fixed to a glass plate that you don't see here, but it's there. And the right one, uh, we can focus laser beams on top of it, and we can capture it with the laser beams. It's called optical tweezer. We can move it away. So practically, we can stretch our cell experimentally like this and measure that depending on the force we exert on this sphere, what's the uh, longer diameter and the smaller diameter deformation. The longer diameter extends, of course, as we stretch it. The transfers of diameter will, will contract a little bit. And uh, the first simulation that you just compiled, hopefully, that uh, we'll do this simulation and um, we'll try to run it and visualize it in Pereview if we manage. So now the first thing to execute it and um, what you see here is a really bad practice as I point out there, I will tell you why. Um, if somebody asks you who said you to do it, then it was not me, the guy went that way, right? <laughs> but for now, um, in the folder of uh, this stretch cell, which uh, I suppose you compiled, but if not, then you can just go into below hemo cell, examples, stretch cell. There you will find a config XML file. For every single simulation that we'll do, there is always a config XML file that contains all the parameters for that simulation. For now, just edit it and set Tmax to 10,000. That is the maximum number of iterations we will take is 10,000. It will be enough for uh, the login node anyways.
if you edited it, then you can just run the simulation with, uh, with this command, invoke it in the local folder. And this is the bad practice part. You are not supposed to run actual simulations on the login node, and uh, in the subsequent part, we will not do that anymore. This is just for simplicity. So this line with many people, right? So quite few of you could already run the simulation. What happens underneath is relatively simple as well. It's a pre-created uh, script file for you that takes all the outputs of the simulation and converts it to a format that can be visualized with Pereview. And this last step is necessary because Pereview will run on your local notebook. The reason for that is that we don't have access currently to the visualization cluster. It's just much more simple to do it on your notebook. Also, it's a small data set, so it's quite possible. The point is that this TMP folder you will find uh, where you run the simulation in the same folder, that contains all the output files. And after the script, it's prepared for, for Pereview visualization. So with the same tool, you copied the archive files to the login node at the beginning, whether it's CyberDoc, FileZilla, HCP, whatever. You can use that to copy this TMP folder back to your local notebook. And Hopefully you also have a Pereview installed. If not, in the meantime, you can install it. It's a small, relatively small application. We will use that in a moment to visualize the output of this simulation. Is it okay? Okay. So. That's good. If you run it again, then it will be TMP one, two, three, four, and X is the number. Yeah, ambiguous. Yeah. For next year, I will fix it. Hopefully, you have the PDF slides, and then you can continue. We should just go ahead a little bit because many people already have the output. And then uh, the idea is <coughs> that if you have Pereview installed, <coughs> then uh, there are a couple of XDMF files, XMF files, that's the um, three character abbreviation in the TMP folder that you just copied. So you can go directly to Pereview and then open one of these XMF files. If you see it <coughs> listed with three dots, that's because there are a couple of files underneath and Pereview just realized that they are the same data set, different time iterations of the same simulation. So Pereview will collapse it to uh, one item and you can open that. It's obvious if you start to open it in Pereview, you, you will recognize everything. The only thing to make, uh, to pay some attention to, is that when you open it, it will pop up a small window asking uh, which decoder you want to use for this file format, XDMF or XDMF3. Well, Pereview is a funny software uh, in a way. If you use anything else than XDMF, then it will crash, regardless of the version. So please use this one. That's the only thing. And if you <clears throat> opened it, then you will see somewhere here a big apply button because Pereview is meant for large data scales. Uh, there is always an additional step of applying everything because if you just click to the wrong place with a huge several terabyte data set, then you can wait for a while. So just in case you have to apply it, you have to apply everything. And then uh, one thing to change, here at the top, you will see the coloring of, uh, of this 3D cell. From solid color, you can change it to, that's a scroll down menu, you can select several forces to visualize. I suggest total force to start with. That will show the total force that acts on the particle. And then if you press the play button somewhere at the top, then it will play the subsequent iterations of the simulation and show the output. What you will see is that a cell there stretch from the two sides the same or very similar to the experiments. You can imagine again that here is a silica bead, here is another one, and with an optical tweezer we stretch one of those. So our cell will deform. So far so good? Ish, at least for those who already succeeded with the, with the simulation. If you're still compiling, then you will get to this stage soon, hopefully. But uh, if you can run this simulation, that practically means that you can use any preset simulations of HemoCell. So um, 
I will move on a little bit, but we will use exactly the same steps for the next ones. Uh, the whole idea from this point is to scale the simulation up, right? You had a couple of iterations with a single cell. That might not be that interesting. We might want to go to larger systems, as I mentioned, the typical uh, simulation workflow. That's also HemoCell, and that was also rendered here in Barcelona. That visualization group is pretty good. The additional applications, for now, you can find them uh, in the PDF. We'll just uh, skip because I think it will be much more useful to do an additional simulations quickly. At least one, but maybe, maybe more. So we will move on to a somewhat larger scale simulation. We will simulate a vessel section. Um, the interesting part here is uh, that small vessels present a really unique behavior. These are viscosity curves. Let's just look at the blue curve now. That's uh, when you have the hematocrit at 45%, so that's uh, a healthy value. What happens is that if you take an amount of blood, flow it through um, a straight pipe, for example, then as you go down with the diameter of the pipe, you put it to smaller and smaller pipes, what you find is that the viscosity drops severely until you get to somewhere around 8 micron which is sort of logical because 8 micron is the size of the red blood cell. This means that we went below the size of the red blood cell and we are starting to squeeze them through a really, really narrow channels. But otherwise, it's the same phenomenon again that we have a lubrication layer of plasma around the cell, um, the bulk flow, so close to the wall. And uh, the size of that is more or less um, constant. So as we move to smaller and smaller channels, the relative size is actually larger and larger because the absolute size is the same and the vessel size goes down. So we will try to simulate this case. And uh, in the same example folders, you will, you will find a, a pipe flow case set up for you. The compilation steps are exactly the same. Compile SH. This time it will be fast because the whole HemoCell library is already compiled for the previous example. So it will take just a couple of seconds now. But a problem that uh, comes up with uh, all kinds of suspension simulations. And uh, why I'm showing this is that it's quite typical that the initial configuration of a system is, is not easy to get. Um, that means that, OK, you want to simulate, or at least I suggest you to want to simulate um, blood flows in the vessels. But how do you get an initial configuration for the cells? You can put them down like this. The thing is that it will take ages to get to a well-mixed system. It's not a trivial question how to start your simulation, which uh, status you should start it from. So in this case, we will use a quick simulation to arrange ourselves in the initial position that is good enough. Technically, we will use a simulation to set up the simulation. Uh, it will not go deeper than this, but the simulation that uh, will now you do to set up the simulation works like it takes a red blood cell and computes the encompassing ellipsoid. The idea here is that working with the ellipsoid to compute collisions is much more simple, much more less costly than with the biconcave complex shape of the cell. So we take lots of these ellipsoids, we put them in a domain, and uh, according to some force law, practically we calculate the overlapping volumes, and then we push them away from each other proportionately to the overlapping volume. So it's a really simple uh, mechanical simulation, which will run fast, but uh, it can demonstrate why it's not really good to use the login node. So now if you go to the Pexels folder, it's also uh, underneath HemoCell, not the examples, but uh, tools-pexel, and you compile this one, which again will just take a second or so, maybe two then it will compile for you the simulation that sets up the larger simulation. And the way to invoke it is PEC cells and afterwards X, Y, Z, the hematocrit that you want, and minus R, which just you allow the cells to rotate. That's not important for now. So you can just use this command to initialize a domain uh, of uh, 40 times 20 twi times 20 micron. Right? This is in SI units, it's micron. 
40 microns time. If uh, you just execute pack cells without any argument, then it will give a help and it will describe it. Um, why I would like you to try it is because this code is parallelized differently from Hemo self itself. It uses OpenMP, probably you heard about that as well today. It uses all the local cores that are available on the login node. Means that if you start this, it will take a look at the login node. Login node has, I think, 24 cores or so. It will use all of them. Which, uh, which means that all the other people who want to use the login node will not be able to because all the cores will compute your simulation. So this is a really good test to see what happens. Because of course uh, the system is prepared for this, you should not be able to abuse it, right? So now you can try it out at least. And of course it will not work. Many of you have it already, or in the process of, of having it, the, the previous one. How many of you could run this Pexel stuff? All right. Are you trying or you gave up? Cool. Can I help? It's compiling still. Still compiling? It should be, really, it should be a second or so. So we are compiling something else. Yeah. The, the previous one, right? The stretch yeah. cell no, one. No, no, yeah, this one. Okay, you can open another terminal and just do this parallelly. Right? It's going to be fast. This is a really small program. Right. Then the whole point is that when you execute it, it will start to use up all the cores on the login node, and then there are daemons in the background, scripts in the background uh, that keep look at um, your resource requirements and resource usage and they will just kill this application. So you practically cannot run it on the login node. What you can do, of course, and this is, well, we can call it the basics of, uh, of uh, HPC usership. You can take a look at the available queues with this command. I assume you already did that today, but if you're not, um, let's just try it. It will list out all the available queues, which is probably interactive and training for now. Something like that. From those, we can request an interactive session. That means that up to this point, you were working on the login node. The whole computational cluster is behind that login node, and you cannot really access it directly any other way. What you do with this one is you ask the scheduler system to reserve four cores somewhere in the computational cloud in this uh, interactive cluster part. And uh, if there are available resources, so if it can find at least four cores that are empty, uh, it will give back an interactive shell that looks exactly like the login node, but it will no longer be called login. So if you look at the beginning of your bash shell, the beginning of your bash line, you will see that the login name, the name of the computer changed. It's no longer the login node. You will receive some other four cores uh, in the cluster. And the whole point of that is um, that there are no restrictions, at least not that severe restrictions on those machines as on the login node. So now you can safely execute this line. Um, not really important, you can add this as well, it will speed it, in this specific case, it will speed it up a little bit, like 10%. But this will run in uh, two or three minutes tops, if uh, you can request an interactive session. So far, it's clear. So basically, we are moving from the login node to the computing clouds, but in an interactive manner. So we still see the active shell of, of those machines. Now this Pexel code, if you manage to run it, it will create two files, a platelet and the red blood cell position files. What happens here is that we request a domain size and 20% hematocrit, and then it will fill that domain with uh, a couple of cells. It's gonna be, I don't know, 50 cells or so, not a lot. And the positions and rotation angles of those cells are, are described in these files. So we just copy them to the pipe flow directory and of course, in the pipe flow, if you go there, 
you should compile it, which is, again, if you already compiled any of the simulations previously, it should take just a couple seconds. So only the first compilation should take really, really long. Otherwise, something is wrong. If you manage to do this, then the next step, as always, I will come back to the previous slides, but just quickly to go through the whole stuff, to edit the config XML where you can set the resolution, it will uh, use a generic cylinder geometry for vessels, so you can set arbitrary resolution. If you want to do the same simulation with much more numerical cells, you can say here 400, and then it will divide it to much more small cells. This is adequate for now. You can set the flow velocity. That is the force driving uh, the flow to be now 0.2 Reynolds number. That's relatively low if you have any CFD knowledge. That's pretty slow. It's in the Stokes flow regime. But that's what happens on the level of, of really small vessels. And you can set the maximum uh, iteration number to 10,000. You can go up to 100,000 or so because it's going to be fast. And then <clears throat> this is one line to remember. It's a general one, how you execute an MPI application on multiple cores. This is one example. I will show another one. This means that we will run this pipe flow executable. We again give the config XML as an argument. Typically, it's, it's the same as the previous simulations. And we request it to run on four cores. So the scheduler will put it up on those four cores available in your interactive session. It will output a lot of lines, and you will see your computation progressing. It will tell you how fast the flow is going, how many cells are in that, what's the viscosity, all kinds of statistics. Um, and by the end of it, the same thing will happen. You will have either a TMP or an output folder in the simulation folder. You can run the batch post process, which will create the Pereview files. You can move it to your notebook and visualize the whole stuff uh, in Pereview. And at this point, I was thinking, depending on the time, uh, I will talk a little bit on the back end. This will not happen. Uh, instead, I will help you to progress with the actual simulations. But in the slides, you can find additional information on how these simulations are typically parallelized, such as spatial decomposition. For example, what happens if, uh, if you have a curved channel, then if you subdivide it to three cores, it will cut out three dense matrix from the domain, and it will disregard this part, which is practically empty. So um, it's a way to use spatial decomposition as a way to throw away parts that do not contain uh, useful information. So of course, we will not spend any computational time here, for example. And uh, necessarily, on the boundaries, we have to communicate a little bit. This is uh, how it looks when you scale it up a little bit. Now you are running it on four cores, or we'll run it in a moment, hopefully in four cores. But um, if you have a larger domain, uh, in this case, it's running on, I think, something like 700 cores. Every differently colored block is a separate computing core. Um, this is the most simple spatial decomposition that's possible. If uh, you go into simulations deeper, then you will find that usually this is not adequate because, for example, um, there are simulation domains here that are barely filled with cells. That's because cells are moving away from the wall. So during the simulation, there can be load balancing issues. This spatial decomposition is usually not kept constant, but during the simulation, we can uh, repartition the whole domain again and then try to create blocks with uh, homogeneous load distributions. So every block should take the same amount of time to compute. Otherwise, the rest of the nodes wait on one, which is not really good if you run a simulation on, on thousands of cores. This is just an example that currently HemoCell is being used on these computers. And of course, the top right, that should be familiar. Um, and a sneak peek that this was the largest run that we tried with HemoCell. It was a really short one, but it's something like 8 million uh, red blood cells. That's 2 cubic millimeter of blood. And the interesting part is that on the right side, it's uh, visualized with Pereview. Uh, well, it's not even this data set, but a smaller one. And it's a little bit low resolution, but you can see that there are many computing nodes in the visualization. So uh, these computation produce data sets so huge 
if you want to take a look at it, usually your notebook is not enough. In this case, uh, we use 128 different nodes, each with, I think, 16 cores to visualize the whole data set. And uh, that is one really good aspect of Peraview. That's why I think it's worth to invest in it and learn it a little bit. It's a really flexible tool. If you have a proper computing backend, then uh, it has a really separated foreign backend uh, structure. So the computation for the visualization can be run on uh, some cluster. And here, I'm, I'm sure that they do have a visualization cluster reserved for Peraview, for example, or at least on which you can use Peraview as well, so that um, the user interface runs, for example, on your notebook. But uh, all the rendering rasterization for these images are being done somewhere in, uh, in the cluster. Um, this is the second part of the slide I will go back to. And uh, for those who could complete the Pexel simulation as well and could run the uh, four-core simulation, for the rest I will help in a moment. But if you want to go ahead or you want to take a look at it later, what happens in this slide is that if you want to scale it up and submit as, it as a proper job, probably you did that today as well, but let's say let's say not, you want to have a longer simulation, much longer than, uh, than the lifetime of an interactive session because you want to run it overnight, not while you are sitting at it. Then what you do is you write up a job file. This is uh, a standard uh, script file, and there is a template in the scripts folder in Hemo cell 4 specifically for Mara Nostrum. It looks like this one. This script file, this is what's inside the file. It specifies the name of this task. You can give it an arbitrary name. It specifies the file to which the output goes, because if you do not have the shell terminal, like you are sitting in front of an interactive one, so whatever it prints out, you see. But if you submit it as a job, then you will not see the output, right? It happens somewhere in the cluster. Then the output and the error output goes into these two files. You can decide their names. You can decide how many uh, cores you want to request for this run and uh, uh, which queue you can use now the training queue instead of the interactive queue that you just used before, how much time you would like to request, and what's the actual command that will run on those. So if you submit this, and submit meaning that you put uh, all this into job.sh, for example, in whatever file, and use sbatch to submit it, the queuing system will read this one, uh, and as soon as resources are available, we'll execute this command on the requested amount, of course. Um, while this is happening, you can use SQ to keep uh, your eye on the progress. If you have submitted many, many jobs, then this command will list all the jobs that you have submitted and their status. And if you realize that you submitted something, let's say you submitted a run that would take three years on 10 million cores, and you think that probably it's not a good idea, that you can cancel it, of course, as well. And uh, with every simulation after it, it executed, then you can just batch post process, and uh, you can visualize either the output or TMP folder, right? So nothing changes there. The only thing is that uh, if you want more cores or long, longer, longer run, then uh, you should create a job file and submit it as a proper job instead of using an interactive session. Interactive sessions are used for development, typically. And if you manage to, to run Pexels and the four-core simulation, then you would see a few microseconds flow of, of this setup. If you submit it as a batch file, then you will see exactly this image. How you can see that it was run on more cores is that the fluid domain shows the domain um, the whole fluid region shows the, the domains of each course. So you can see these colored boxes. Those are the subsequent processors that were computing this specific setup. And uh, just for the really odd ones, ones and then uh, I think it's, it's quite enough for now. If you think about it, um, that pipe flow is relatively easy because it's periodic. Right? You can drive it with a body force, for example. What goes out on the right side will come back on the left side. Many times, geometries are not like that. So for example, in this case, flow downwards, whatever cell goes out at the bottom will come back at the top. Problem is that here we have, again, an aneurysm, which will start to fill up with cells. 
but because the number of cells is constant in the application, it's a closed system, uh, in the main channel you will have less and less cells. So one solution is to drive it somehow in a way that you can allow new cells to enter constantly, but then of course it cannot be periodic. So a typical solution for this is that we do a periodic channel exactly like the one that you are currently simulating, and every cell that goes out is also put back because it's periodic, but next to that we can copy it to a different domain. So whatever comes into this domain looks exactly like the output of this pipe. That practically means two simulations coupled together. A periodic one which drives the flow and then an arbitrary domain which can have whatever look because you will always have fresh cells coming in at the inlet. Um, this one is also set up for you if you feel like trying it. In that case, what you will see, again, with a small pipe flow, that there is a pipe which is periodic. This will just go around and around. And that drives another domain where all the cells reaching the endpoint of the pipe, they will just get deleted. And those cells that are wrapped around at the periodic domain will enter at the beginning of the pipe. Right? But this is for, for the braver people who really are interested in blood flow simulations. It's also in the examples folder. Everything I talked about is in the examples folder, so you can just try it out for yourself if you have the time. And otherwise, um, I included a few steps. This is just a general overview how each and every simulation works. For example, this uh, previous periodic pre-inlet domain thing also, but this list is more or less true for every simulation in HemoCell. So if you ever want to do some red blood cell simulations, you can just look this up and follow this with every, every single case. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, I hope that you learned something new. I know that it was not the easiest part to uh, follow it up, but I have to tell you that uh, you did much better than, uh, than last year's students. So I think it's, uh, it's an upgoing curve, which is always nice. So thanks a lot for your attention.